Good evening. This is Wednesday night Bible study. It's been a few weeks since we've been here. Had a couple things on the agenda, namely fishing and other fun stuff. We have another joiner here, which is good. It's okay. We are uh, already started, but you can come on in. It's all good. We're just we're just getting started here. So Matthew chapter six. <clears throat> pick up at verse number twenty-five. So if you have your Bibles, go and turn to Matthew chapter number six. This is the part of Matthew chapter 6 that I really, uh, I really take as a, if you're going to apply uh, any part of the book, um, you know, people can say, well, these ones are outlandish, like cutting off your hand or, or uh, plucking out your eye and things like that. that that's outlandish. Or, or uh, bring your gift to the altar. Well, we don't have an altar anymore. Jesus Christ has completed that. You know, whatever they can try to say that they're, that they're not going to do. But, but there's an area here in, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 25 that, that really is the summation of everything that he's said. Okay? And the summation is this, right? Uh, if you start over in verse 8, he talks about uh, uh, this, this phrase. He says, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father what? Knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And so he's going to make a comparison now about their na- basic needs. What is a basic need of a human being? What are things you have to have to, to survive? Well, you have to have water, right? You have to have food, right? You have to have some clothes, and that's about it, right? You don't have to have a house, right? It's nice to have shelter, right? But but food, raiment, and uh, you know, and, and water are things that are kind of the, the necessities of life. Don't they say it's you know three sec three three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food, right? Something like that, and you can the, the, the threes of what it is. So obviously, it's very it's a very big necessity. Now, what's really interesting is. Why he brings up, in just the next second, the, this, this phrase here, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Well, as we discussed, the, the, the context surrounding Matthew chapter 6 is the impending great tribulation of those days, right? And so because you see that impending great tribulation, you see the wrath of God, he's discussed that there's no need for you to, to you know, uh, possess anything on the earth, because guess what? <laughs> It's all going to burn up. We know what takes place in that wrath of God. We know what takes place in that day of the Lord. So he's going to tell you now the next phrase is, take no thought for your life. It's going to be a little bit easier to do that when you understand the, 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 the rationale behind it. Going on to say, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Right. So that's the three things that he talks about. He says, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and what you're going to put on. Right. Those are your basic necessities. Now, he doesn't say, take no thought for where you're going to go to college. Take no thought whether or not you're going to get into the master's program, <laughs> get your MBA. Take no thought if you're going to get into med school and pass the, you know, GRE or whatever other exam you're trying to do. You see how it's like this is so far removed from the modern thought of of what God is, you know, thinking of your life that if we could bring people back to this and say, look, these guys are saying take no thought for your life. I mean, like for your life. Like you have no, you don't, Paul says, I don't even count my own life dear to me, right? Remember him say that in, in the book of Acts? You know why he says that? He says that kind of when they say that he's, he's going to go to Jerusalem, right? And they're all going to kill him. Remember all that whole story there? Some of you familiar with that? Some of you aren't, right? And so when he says he's going to go to Jerusalem, they say, look, Jesus told you not to go to Jerusalem. And, 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 and Agabus told you and the prophets told you and Luke told you not to go. And everybody else I was with you said not to go and they're going to kill you. And he looks at him and says, I'm not only ready to be bound, but I'm also ready to die for his name's sake, right? For I hold my life not even dear to me, but that I may finish my course and testify to the grace of God and all the rest of the things that he says, right? Paul goes on to make a very, you know, big statement, right? To, he, he says, he says that one thing that is quoted at every funeral and it is to live is Christ and to die is gain, right? That's the real mentality that one can have that seems completely foreign to most. Most in Christendom do not believe that way. Most do not think uh, to, 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 to live as Christ and to die is gain. They, they, they are still scared of death. They want to continue to do things, to experience life, thinking that death is the end, right? It's easy to fall into that mentality. And what you see here in Matthew chapter 6 is Jesus Christ saying, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. See, where it all begins is in your mind. Where it all begins, what I have written in my Bible here, is this is, as always, the battle for the mind. Right? Everything you do is a battle for your mind. It's a battle for how you think about things. Right? 
If you're spiritually minded, it's life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. So if these guys are seeing all the death around them, right? We know how much death is going to be. How much death is going to take place during this tribulation period? So much so that Christ actually says, if, if, if these, unless these days were shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. How many people are going to die? <laughs> A lot of people will be killed during this period of time. We went through and we read those verses in the book of Revelation. Remember those? Revelation chapter 8, Revelation chapter 9, 10, 11, some of those other ones. And we read how crazy it gets, right? And I want to say, like, okay, put yourself there, right? Don't, don't just think of this as being something that's just foreign. Put yourself in that position. Think about that's what you're getting ready to go into. When Jesus Christ is being crucified and the ladies are standing there, right? They're weeping for him. And he goes, weep not for, for me. Weep for yourselves, right? For the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the wombs which never bear, the pastors never gave sock, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, think about, think about that, right? Think about what that means. And when he says here, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, he's saying down to what your life is in essence, the bare necessities. We're going to discuss how it is a battle for the mind. We'll discuss how the mind is always affected, how Satan works to ill affect the mind. It's what he does. It's where he goes. It's where he wants to do. It's where he wants to kind of finally get control of the, the way you think. And you have a mind that is surprisingly powerful. Your mind does a lot of things that you don't even realize it does. And it creates, as, as Paul writes down, imaginations. You know, if you have a fear of, if you, if, a, if you have a fearful or a, a worrisome, you know, mentality, well, it's going to be kicked off right here and you're going to go into a full-blown panic attack right? When you find out what you're getting ready to go into. So how can you, going through something, be able to escape that? How do Navy SEALs do it? Training, right? Conditioning. How do they go through and they, they sleep for like 13 minutes or whatever it is. It's, some, it's like 12 minutes. Whatever random number it is that they need to sleep for. The one guy sits there, the one guy gets 12 minutes sleep. They literally, they just, they fall asleep because they're so tired. They've been up for like 40 hours, right? And they just fall asleep for 12 minutes. They're up and they've conditioned themselves to get these real quick bursts of sleep and go back and forth. How can one do that? Have you ever heard of a foxhole? You know what a foxhole is? I mean, the foxhole, what, 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 is, what, is, what is a foxhole known for? Well, it's when every, it's when every atheist becomes a believer, right? That's the joke, right? And if you've seen, they, they made a, the recently with Memorial Day, you know, they made a Memorial Day um, dedication, and it says, to all the uh, atheists who were in foxholes. And then, you know, the joke is, there are no atheists in foxholes. There's actually a plaque and a big, you know, uh, monument in, uh, what's the big garden out there? The big memorial gardens. Arlington Seminary, right, right, so cemetery. So in Arlington Cemetery, they have a, a, a thing for all the free thinkers and atheists who are in the foxhole, right? Come on, right? You know how it gets. If the plane's going down, what is everybody doing? Dear Jesus, save me! God, I promise I'll be good, right? Why? Because their life becomes, you know, a point of, of ending, right? They see the end that's there. So inside of, of, of Matthew chapter 25, I said I like to bring people here because I want to ask people if they do this. I want to ask people, do you have a 401k? Oh, you do? Hmm. You know what that indicates to me? That means you have a lack of faith. It's the previous verse says you cannot serve God and mammon. So which one are you serving? Are you serving God? I don't think anybody can flat out tell me that they spend more time serving God than they do serving their work. Right? Anybody here can say that? Uh, no, that's what I thought. Nobody can. And if you were to, if you were to even ask the pastors that question, they serve more mammon. Uh, one of my friends just sent me some pictures of the new Bridgepoint Church. I'll, I'll talk about it. I'll probably get in trouble, but it's okay. Same picture of their server room. Wow. Impressive. If you want to see it, I can show you the pictures afterwards. And they have their facility coming, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars spent on this facility. And he says they're growing. They're growing in great numbers. Uh, and their facility is, uh, is booming. And, uh, you know, uh, it's an interesting ministry, right? Why is it why is it booming? And why is Suncoast Bible Fellowship, you know, have thirty people on a big Sunday, right? I mean, think about it, why is that? Well, the message of Jesus Christ here is probably gonna not be that well received, is it? Right? Think many people are gonna like this message? 
think many people are going to believe it. They're going to want to take that on. They're going to say, yeah, this this sounds great. Let's do it. No, most of them are probably just going to say, nah, I'm not interested. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do my own thing. But what eventually happens is the truth would catch up with them and they would see what takes place. So when you see in Matthew chapter 26, verse 25, you know, bring people here and say, therefore I say unto you, right? Remember what we said before about anything that Jesus Christ says. It's not his word. It's the word of God. He says he only speaks in the direction of God the Father. His doctrine is not his, but him that sent him. And so when he says, therefore I say unto you, this is, this is God saying, take no thought for your life. None. It doesn't say worry a little bit about the important things of your life. It says actually take no thought for your life. And he says, what ye shall eat. I think we all go. Where are we going? BJ's? Uh, anybody want to go down and get some carabas? Man, bonefish sounds kind of good. Ooh, maybe some Sonny's pulled pork, right? Pretty sure we, we take some thought for what we eat, right? So let's be real. Be realistic about what you're, what you're actually you know, operating in. If you're saying that, yes, I operate underneath this program. I operate. I do the things here. Okay, then let's put it to the test. See, to, to go into the tribulation does not mean that you prep for it, right? It's not mean you prep for it. it. Actually, means the exact opposite. It's a full and total dependence upon God because the more you prep for it, what's the problem going to be? You're going to be concerned about all those things you gathered. You're going to be concerned about all the stuff that happened. If 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 it happened like this, where God walked in with Moses into Egypt and said, "Hey guys, we're leaving. Pack your bags. Oh, you guys have property here." Oh, well, you might want to get it leased out before we leave. No. We'll just get up and go. Time is now, right? Let's, let's roll. We're, we're, we don't have any time to mess around. Let's get out of this place, right? And he removed them from that place. And when he removed them from that place, what took place? There was a complete and total 100% dependence upon God, right? Did they have, did they have any... Um, food? No. They have any water? No. What do they complain about? You're, you let us out into the desert. You let us out into the wilderness and we're all going to die. Great. Thanks, God. What are they going to say? For mischief, you dragged us out here to kill us. All the Egyptians are going to laugh at you. And what does Moses do? He does the unbelievable. Water comes from where? A rock, right? comes from a rock. Can you get water from a rock? Anybody seen water from a rock before? No? And what is that just a testament to? It's a testament to that, look, what God is doing, he created the rock, he created the water, he can do whatever he wants to do. So what Satan wants you to do is he wants you during this tribulation period of time, or the, or the person, I say you, I mean the person that is here at this time in, in Matthew chapter 6 in history, he wants that person to have a split trust. He does not want you to have total dependence and reliance upon God. He's always looking to do what? Reduce your faith. So when you see here in Matthew chapter 6 verse 25, take no thought for your life, well the life consists of what? What you shall eat. What you shall drink, that's what people think. Nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. But now look at this statement. Is not the life more than meat and the body raiment? He's like, isn't this more what it's about? You know, life is not just about eating food and the body is just about putting clothes on. What is more about it? What is, what is the crux of life? Well, look what he says. He's going to use life application. He's going to say, well, here's some things that you can physically see. It's always easier to believe something that you see. It is. Just how it goes. You ever had one of those guys knock on your door? Knock, knock, knock. Hey, you want to buy this stuff? It's real good. I promise. Check out what it can do. It can, well, I put all this blood. I put all this blood. Oh, it's gone. Whoa, that's amazing. How much do you want to buy? You want to buy a gallon? If I give you two gallons right now, I give you a discount. Three gallons, I'll give you one gallon for free. And you're like, ooh, that's pretty cool. And I did some cool stuff. I mean, why is it that when you watch those infomercials, you get stuck and you're like watching them. You're like, why am I watching this? Why am I watching OxyClean take away the grass stains? Why, why do I care about this, right? Why? Because when you see it, what, do you, what, is it, what does it help you do? It helps you believe. You go, ooh, I see it. I see it better. Remember, remember Doubting Thomas? 
What did he do? Mouth off. Was a doubter. Along with all the other apostles, mind you. Thomas just gets the bad rap. He's not, he wasn't the only doubter. There's plenty of doubters. Thomas is just vocal about his doubting. He says, unless I see him, and unless I put my fingers in the holes. Eh, I don't believe it. Right? What does Christ do? Comes in and says, here, you want to touch him? <laughs> and what does Thomas immediately become? Becomes a believer in what took place, right? And Christ makes a statement to him. He says, he says this, he says, Blessed are they who have not seen and believe, right? What takes more faith? I think we're in the, in, the, in the age in which it takes more faith than ever before to believe the gospel. Ever before. The further you get away from the cross and the more you get into a, 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 into a naturalistic law and you get into this, this new age movement and this, this subjectivity and, and postmodern thought and rel relativistic ideologies and philosophies, what happens? It becomes increasingly difficult for you to believe the gospel. So when you have God in the flesh, right, to it, that God was in Christ, when you have God in the flesh fulfilling all the prophecies before your eyes, I mean, how is it that you just don't believe it right there and go, okay, you're totally going to believe this, right? Well, the reason why is because you're believing something else, right? And who are you believing? You're believing the lies of Satan. And so you have a choice in life to do that. You have a choice to either believe the lies, the father of all lies. There is no truth in him. That's what he does. You believe the, you believe the devil. People say, well, the devil's never talked to me. People work all the time at, at the agency of the devil. Constantly. They don't even realize that they're acting in an agent capacity of the devil, right? With the devil being the principal and them being an agent, them exercising control and, and, and doing things on behalf of Satan. They don't even realize it. Many in the church today exercise and, and do things on the behalf of Satan unknowingly, right? Here, as we discussed, Satan wants that mistrust. He wants you to not believe what God says. So God is going to use a real life, real world example, which is something that is evident with the eyeballs. Everybody sees. It's not something that's like, well, I don't know. I didn't see that before. No, he's going to say, behold, the fowls of the air. Behold means look at them. Can you look at them? Can you look at it? Right? C can you see them? You see them with your eyes right now? What do you think about them? How do they get their food? Where do they eat? So he says, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they what? Look at this phrase. They sow not. What does a farmer do? He sows his field, right? Tills that field, works that field. Has anybody actually ever seen what a farmer has to do? Wow. What a difficult, miserable job. I encourage you, if you've never done so, to try to grow tomatoes or something, you know? It's a lot harder than it looks. It's real difficult. And it's not just like, oh, let's get the tomato seeds and let's get it going. It's about the land and it's about the pestilence and it's about what do I do? Do I put pesticides on there? Why not? Do I clean? When do I pick them? Was it ripe? Oh, no, they, something happened. Too much water, too much whatever. And so you see, behold the fowls there, for they sow not. Neither do they reap. I don't even know how to do that. Their mind's thinking that it's just going to be there the next day, like it's always been there. And so when God talks about the mammon, right? He says it here in, in verse number 24, you cannot serve God and mammon. He uses that term mammon as, as being money. But, you know, mammon and manna are kind of the same type of thing. It's like the sustenance, right? Manna is sustenance that you need. You need it to, you need it, they need it to live, and so he wanted a what? Daily dependence upon God for their sustenance. It wasn't like, oh, let's gather what you need. But what did everybody do? Even after seeing what took place, what did the people continually do? They continually did not believe God and they continued to store up manna for the next day. God even tells them, it's going to rot, it's going to stink, it's going to be nasty. Well, maybe he's wrong, right? Do you see the mistrust that we have from the very beginning with, with, uh, with, with God and his word? It's always going to be there. So how do we overcome that? Well, what are the apostles always asking Jesus to do? Increase our faith. Increase our faith. What are they really saying when they say increase our faith? Show me. Show me something. Let me see something. But see, the real blessing comes in those who have not seen and yet believe. So I've said it's very difficult. I think it's incredibly difficult to become a believer today. To believe the gospel? Why? Why would you believe that? Right? Aren't there so many other things of science that can explain all this stuff away, right? 
I mean, don't listen to Christopher Hitchens if you're not, you know, relatively firm and resolute in the scripture because he'll make you think twice. Guy's not dumb. He's got good, solid, logical arguments against Christianity that I think the majority of Christians, if they actually listen to them, would denounce the faith. I really do. I really truly do. I think if they were to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to listen to what he has to say, and I'm going to be logical and be reasonable. I'm going to listen to this. Because they would have no other basis. They'd have no other foundation. And I'm going to go through this, and I'll show you where we get our foundation today. Look, he says, at the end part of this, he says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Now, what's the next question? Now, if you're going to reap, and you're going to gather, and you're going to sow, and you're going to do all this stuff, are you saying that you're not any better than a, than a fowl? Are ye not much better than they? Right? Now, verse 27, honestly, to me, is an amazing verse. It's an absolutely amazing verse. Which of you, by taking thought, <laughs> can add one cubit unto his stature? I love that verse. I mean, I absolutely love that verse. Because what's instantaneously going through their heads is, but, 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 right? They're just trying to make up excuses, uh, reasons why they shouldn't believe it. But, but uh, what about this? And but, but what about this? Right? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Well, verse 25, he says, take no thought. And if you take a thought, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to let your carnal mind get involved, and your carnal mind's going to go, hmm, well, you know what? Um... I think I should uh, go ahead and start stockpiling sheep in the mountains uh, because the tribulation's coming, and I'll get some goats, and I'll put them on salt, and I'll kill them all, and I'll have some jerky for later. Uh, I'll probably get some jugs and fill them with water. I mean, you can see how this goes, right? It's like, no, God's going to provide for you that. He already told you. He knows what you have need of before you even ask of him. That's, that's exciting. That's good news, right? So in, in this, why would they not? Why would they not trust him? Well, for quite a number of years, they've been having teachers to themselves who um, you know, are not leading them in the way of righteousness, have not been teaching them correctly, and have been, you know, if you if you know much about Jewish history, you know, do you know what the Talmud is? Are you guys familiar with that? The oral teachings, the oral uh, uh, traditions, right? He says, you through your traditions, you 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 just completely void the word of God through your traditions. Remember, they got mad at Jesus for not washing his hands before he before he ate, right? Well, that's not in the scripture. That's in the Talmud, right? And so that Talmud that they use was something that was not the word of God, and therefore it was decreasing the faith of the men. He gives him another example, verse 28. Why take ye thought for raiment? Why do you think about what you're going to wear? Now, let's, if we're going to be real, and as I said, let's go back to this passage. I'm pretty sure everybody today, when they picked out their clothes, decided, hmm, what am I going to wear today? I did. I said, I wanted to wear my brown shoes, so I had to get my brown belt out. And I said, I haven't worn this purple shirt in a while. And uh, my khakis, uh, they really need to be steam. So I had to turn the steamer on. I had to steam the steamers. And then I couldn't find my, bl my blue socks. I said, screw it, I'll just wear my black ones. It's like anybody's really going to see it anyways, right? You took thought. And then you go to Express and you're like, hmm, do I have a coupon? John, do you got a coupon? Oh, I got one on my cell phone. Cool. Let me put, go ahead and check out, right? You see how it's it's... I heard, I heard a good quote. If you don't believe the Bible in context, right? Or if you believe the Bible out of context, you don't really believe the Bible. You believe your own thought, right? It's pretty interesting to think about. If you don't believe the Bible in context for what it really says, you don't actually believe the Word of God at all, but you in fact believe yourself, right? Your faith is not in the Word of God. Your faith is in what you think the Word of God says. I wish people would sit down and say, okay, I'm going to have an open mind. I'm going to come in. I mean, there's a verse in Proverbs where he talks about a, a, fool who, a fool is one who does not listen and hear something all the way out, right? So when somebody has an argument or a legitimate you know, concern, and when they just quickly stop, stop their ears and they won't listen, that's a fool, right? Listen to what the argument is. Make your conclusion, make your decision. I wish I had the verse off the top of my head. I'll find it later. It's worded, obviously, more eloquently than how I just said it. But, but I wish we could sit down and say, guys, would you, be, would you be sincere for a minute? Would you really listen? Would you actually sit down and talk? What do you think the response would be? Honestly, what do you think the response would be? 
I think it would be people wouldn't care. They wouldn't they wouldn't spend two minutes. If you said, okay, I'm gonna go through my my MySpace top ten, right? Whatever, you know what I mean. You're gonna pick your top ten friends. You say, I'm gonna sit down with them and I'm gonna to talk to them about the Bible. Some of them may be believers, some of them may not. But you're gonna say, okay, will you be honest and sincere and sit down, and let's just have a discussion and hear me out on this stuff? You think people would do it? I really don't think so. I did it for a while. I picked a lot of my friends from Keswick, started talking to them, and people are like, what? What? What are you talking about? You're crazy. So it's not unreasonable here to, to try to use this scripture for the benefit of, of provoking thought, right? That's what we should use the scripture to do, provoking thought, making somebody think about it, make their thought process be, wait, why are you believing what you believe about this particular scripture? And for these guys, they're to take no thought about their, you know, uh, what they, about their life. They don't think anything about what they're going to eat. They take no thought because what if you, what, what are you going to think about that's going to add one cubit to your stature, right? What's going to make you more knowledgeable? What's going to make, I love the verse in Job. Um, you know, I wish I could find it. I, I, I'll, I'll look for it real quick here uh, if I can find it. I, I have it highlighted. But it's a, it's a really it's a really good passage. And he says, um, let me grab it here. He goes through and, and, and God says a bunch of questions to him. He says, where were you when this happened? And, and where were you when this happened? And how about this, right? Yeah, how about this? I like, I like this verse in Job chapter number thirty. Uh, in Job chapter 38, right? This is the same thing. He, he says, The Lord answered Job out of, the, out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Uh, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand thee and answer thou me. Uh, here's some questions for you. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or, or, or who shut up the seas with the doors, when it break forth as it hath issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud garment thereof, and the thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for my decreed place, and set the bars in the doors too, right? Where? Were you there? Did you see that? Who? How do you know anything, right? See, man, men are very proud. Men don't realize that they have so much faith in what has occurred, right? I had somebody tell me the other day, they said, you know, I'd I like to live forever. And I said, what is one of the reasons why you want to live forever? What, wouldn't it become boring at some point? He says, no, I want to live forever because I could keep learning and I could keep understanding and keep knowing more and more and more and more. I, I, get, I get sad to think that I could never read everything that Wikipedia has to offer. I get sad to think that I could never actually understand all the different things. I, I can only pick one career choice. I can only do one thing. I can't do all these different things, right? That's his thought process. That's what he's, that's what he's thinking about. And I'm like, wow, you enjoy all these things that God created even in a fallen world, yet you won't believe him and have eternal life, right? And you can go enjoy whatever God created for all eternity, right? Think about that for a second, right? They just, they just won't, they won't accept that. They won't, they won't take that. They won't, they won't go and say, yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea, but they want to keep living and living and living and living. They want to have eternal life. But here's the thing. Everything that guy is going to do, it's going to be based upon faith. Why? Because he's not, wasn't there, you know? Who here saw and experienced the Vietnam War? Nobody. How do you know the Vietnam War occurred? Somebody else saw it and they wrote it down. Right? How about the War of 1812? Anybody there? No? Didn't think so. Anybody know who Nero is? Anybody ever saw Nero meet Nero? No? Any of your friends saw and met Nero? No? Your grandparents? No? Your great-grandparents? No? Right? How do you know he even existed? Again, because it's recorded, right? And people will place their faith and their trust in everything except the Word of God, right? Oh, it's filled with error. Oh, it's so it's so doubtful. So your history books aren't full of error then, right? We continue to trust those. We continue to rely upon those. We sit there in school and learn and learn and learn and learn and rely upon what people have to say. We have faith. Right? Isn't that what you're doing? Is that not exercising faith? It's believing what somebody else says about an event that you have no other rec record of, right? Well, it's got to be true because lots of people believe it, right? Well, that's, that sounds ridiculous to me. You know how ridiculous that sounds? Well, let's talk about all the things that people thought that were good and then they turned out to be horrible. 
How about George Washington dying from bloodletting? Because they thought that would help you and heal you, right? George Washington died because of bloodletting. Oh, he's sick. Gotta let some blood out of him. Who thought that was a good idea? Somebody at some point in time, right? Who knows? Maybe one day we'll come back full circle. They've done that before too. They said, this is really bad. It causes cancer. They come back and say, no, just kidding. It doesn't cause cancer. It actually helps you. Then three years later, oh, it causes cancer again, right? You see that constantly a cycle. And what does that prove? Man doesn't really know anything, okay? Now, granted, men are pretty amazing. The mind that God has given man is pretty crazy, right? I mean, do I know exactly how, you know, astrophysicists, you know, come up with concoctions to do certain things to send people to space and, you know, no, I don't know that stuff. A lot of it's conjecture, of course, as well. But, you know, when you see things like just the drugs that we have today, the way we can look through a microscope and see the organisms and find out what, a, what works against what, what's resistant to this, what's resistant to that, it's pretty amazing stuff, right? But I always love how they're, they're using things found in the world. Nobody, nobody, nobody created anything, right? It's not like, oh, we, we created this drug. No, you didn't. You took stuff that was in the earth, and then you put it together, and you did a mashup. Good. That's a good one. They did a mashup. They didn't do an original. Anyways, I digress. Go back to Matthew chapter 6. Almost done here. A few minutes, and we'll be close. He says, why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. So here's the other thing. The lilies. Everybody sees them. Everybody knows what they do. They grow. But guess what? They don't toil. They don't sit there on the spinner and spin their clothes, right? Does anybody even know how to spin clothes? Have you ever seen that before? Go to Thomas Edison's house and you can watch the little spinner things. Remember that? Please tell, tell me somebody went to Edison's house. Yeah. In, in school? I'm the only one that's been to Thomas. You went there. Okay. So a couple people, Stephanie went there. You know, everybody went to Thomas Edison's house. That's part of growing up. You just like do that. In Florida, at least. Anyways, I thought that was really cool. All right, so, and he says this, he says, he says, neither do they spin, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He's giving an example, he's saying everybody knows who Solomon was, in all his glory, what he did, what he looked like, what, his, what he accomplished, all of that, he was not arrayed like one of these. Therefore, look at this, now this is very important. This is where the crux of the issue is. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven... Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Turn with me to the book of, uh, of uh, uh, Romans. Or actually, turn, turn, to, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll close with this. I'm just going to read these two verses, and we'll, we'll close. Okay? Five verses, and we'll close. I promise, this is the last verses. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 1, he says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, right? And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. If you have worry, people always go, be, be, uh, what's the verse? Be anxious for nothing, but in prayer and supplications, let your requests be made known unto God, right? Well, all that really does, right? That verse, be careful for nothing, be anxious for nothing. All that verse does is let your prayer and request be known to God. Okay, God knows about them already. He gets, he has, he understands the issues you have. Well, you need to understand how the spiritual attacks work, right? So if you have that anxiety, if you have that fear, if you have that, you know, uh, 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 behavior inside where you're just, you're, you're frightened or, or, or you're concerned, you have to understand that your weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God of the pulling down of strongholds in the way that you cast down imaginations. Imaginations are the thoughts, the battle for the mind, as we've always talked about. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and we should bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's a difficult task. It's not something you can do uh, 100% of the time, but when you do operate in that manner, it works very well. And that's why for these guys, they should listen to what he has to say. Now, here's the crux of the whole thing, right? The hard part is this. Man, it never happened. Right? The tribulation never occurred. Whew, mind blowing. 
right? Is that something that you see how that kind of works? You're like, well, he's leading them all into the tribulation. Then it never happens. Why? Well, if you didn't understand the mystery, wouldn't that be very much a, a concern to you about the legitimacy and the veracity and the truthfulness and the trustworthy nature of the Word of God? I think so. Right? You go, well, it never happened, so he must be a liar. But we understand. We understand that God had a plan. He revealed that prophetic program. He kept the prophetic program in place until he then did reveal the mystery. So, all right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and close and repair. We're 35 minutes in. All right.